And we're going to first talk about the difference between traditional cost accounting and why activity-based costing has come around. Then we're going to introduce uh, the steps involved in performing an activity-based costing system. You know how companies identify, you're going to learn some new ter terminology now is activity cost pools and cost drivers and how we use cost drivers. We're going to look at the benefits and limitations of activity-based costing and we're going to look at value-added versus non-value-added activities. Now, in job costing, you recall that each job takes a different amount of material, different amount of labor, and we assign the overhead to that job. In process costing, what we do is we follow the direct material, the direct labor, and the overhead, which is the process that is converting that raw material into cans of Coke, if you will, we simply divide all that by the output, and that's process costing. Now, that was satisfactory for most, if not all, companies back in the 80s and 90s and right into the 2000s. It was satisfactory. Um, when you looked at the cost of producing a product, generally, the cost would be 40% of the total cost would be direct material and 40% would be direct labor, and 20% would be overhead. And we would assign the overhead and allocate that overhead based on something that is directly related to the production, like machine hours or labor hours or labor dollars. We had on our job sheet, we were keeping track of that information, so therefore we could predetermine, remember, the overhead rate, you determine it at the beginning of the year and you estimate the activity of the base you're going to use. Let's say it's direct labor hours to keep it simple and you come up with a rate. Then you apply that. And that was satisfactory. So 20 percent of my costs. Uh, were overhead and overhead was yeah, pretty stable costs like rent and uh, utilities and things like that. Supervisor salary. And you learn that we're going to be over or under when we assign the overhead to the product. Remember that. That's very important. And we determine that over applied or under applied. And that will be on the exams, believe me. OK, but the point I'm trying to make here is. While we're costing that, if we are out 5%. On allocating our overhead. Well, keep in mind the overhead is 20% of the total cost of the product. And if we're out 5% on the 20, that's 1% of the whole cost of the product. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we were pretty well accurate. We were 99% accurate even when we were under applied by 5% or over applied by 5%. And basically that's what we were. And that was satisfactory. However, because there was a high correlation between direct labor and overhead costs. Now my phone keeps going. Is that because I'm on Teams? You're you're sending me messages. Let me give it straight. Okay, good. I'll keep my phone open so if there are some messages, I can see them right away. Good idea, John. Good idea. Okay, Reem. No, 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 you didn't send me a message. Chat. Activity. Helen. Oh, yeah, okay. What's up, group? Helen wants to know. So, like I said, traditional cost accounting systems were fine. Basically, we took the overhead costs and we applied it to the products with something very directly related to the production of the product, direct labor hours. So if this product had one direct labor hour, it got so much overhead. If it had the next job had two direct labor hours on it, it had so much overhead, okay? But what has happened now 
because of the onset of computers and laser technology and robotics, there's been a tremendous change in manufacturing and service industries. What it means is that direct labor is being replaced by machines. So from our point of view, the cost of direct labor is going down, but the cost of manufacturing overhead is going up because manufacturing overhead is indirect. And that is the depreciation cost on the robots and the depreciation cost on all the lasers and all the computerized system. So that means the, uh, the production process is capital intensive instead of being labor intensive. Capital intensive means we employ a lot of equipment. Labor intensive means we employ direct labor. And so complex manufacturing process may require more than just one allocation base. We've been allocating the overhead as one big number, predetermined overhead, based on the predetermined number of hours. And then I come up with a rate and I allocate it based on one overhead. And so the thinking goes that perhaps we should be changing the way we do the cost accounting system into what we call an activity-based costing system. Now we're changing our whole focus here. Before, we were looking at job costing and allocating the overhead with one driver. We're now looking at determining the cost of every activity that is performed in the overhead cost and come up with a cost per activity. And in that way, we can use multiple activity cost pools. And we're going to assign the activity cost pools, that number in the pool, to the product or services by means of what we now call a cost driver. All right. Now, some definitions, of course. Of course. Activity based costing. We're going to look at all the activities involved in the manufacturing overhead. We're not going to look at direct material and direct labor activities. We're going to look at the activities of managing the overhead, the utility costs, the cost of capacity, the supervisory costs, those kinds of costs, the machine maintenance costs. Those are all overhead and they're different activities. So an activity is an event, an action, a transaction, or a work sequence. Most often a work sequence, that's what we're gonna be talking about, that causes a cost to be incurred in producing a product and providing or providing a service. So you know, if I perform more activities, I'm consuming more costs. So you see, it's recognized that it's activities that consume resources. And that's a whole different way of looking at it. Whereas before we just allocated it based on direct labor. Now we're looking a little more closely at activities. And because we have computers, we can track this data. Now, the next definition is an activity cost pool. Now, when we did job costing back here, we had one overhead cost, one pool, if you will. In that pool, we said, okay, the overhead's gonna be a million dirhams. And the direct labor hours that we think for the whole year are gonna be 200,000. So therefore, the um, manufacturing overhead, the predetermined rate would be $5. So every direct labor hour I worked, I, I applied five dirhams, sorry. That's one pool. Now we're talking about creating a number of pools according to the activity that is being performed. That is, we can have a pool for uh, those overhead costs of ordering materials, of setting up machines, of storing our product. Those are all overhead costs. But we're going to look now and look at the cost of that activity in total for the whole year. And then once we have that, we look at that pool 
And we said, okay, what drives the cost in that pool? And cost driver is any activity that has a direct cause and effect relationship with the resources consumed in that pool. So you see the whole thrust has changed. We're looking at costing activities because we now understand activities consume resources. So now we're going to look at assigning and look at the production of our product. And if this product consume this number of activities, then it's going to pick up that cost. OK, that's the idea now. So to do that, we take the overhead, which was a million, as I said before, and we look at it and we say, look, 200,000 are machine costs. So let's say 200,000 is one pool. Another 200,000 is supervisory costs. OK, another 200,000 is utility costs and so on. So now we have three, four pools instead of one one million dollar pool. All right, I better we go through an example. We'll make this clear. <clears throat> but overall, the theory or the philosophy here is that we allocate overhead costs to the products or services in two steps. First of all, we come up with activity cost pools. We break the million total overhead costs into three or four pools where the activity is fairly similar in each of those pools. And then we assign the overhead allocated to those pools to the products using a cost driver. Now, here we have a system as an overview. We're going to only look at four activities. OK, at the top here, you see total overhead costs. Let's say that's our million. Down below, we have two products. AB bench and AB coaster. Now, before we would allocate those overhead costs based on direct labor hours or direct labor costs or machine costs. But now we take a look at that overhead cost and we say, look, part of percentage of it is purchasing costs. We come up with that. Percentage is storage, percentage is machines, percentage. So now we break this one big pool of overhead costs into four pools. Now, we're only using four here for simplicity. Uh, the company that I work with had over 50 pools, but we're only using four, for example. So now in purchasing, that is, we order the material, we, it's ordered, it's received, when it's delivered, it's put in storage. Well, what's the activity that drives the purchasing costs? Well, the more orders we make during the year, the more we have to receive, the more we have to store, and so on. So the cost driver is the number of purchase orders. So I take then the total cost of purchasing, I estimate that, and I estimate the number of purchasing orders for the year, and I come up with an activity-based rate for purchasing. Okay. Storage. Well, what drives storage? The amount of square foot each product takes. So therefore, I'm going to assign it based on the square footage. Machining. Well, the number of hours. The more hours, the more total machining costs. And that might include utilities and things like that. Supervision. Well, the number of employees. So you see, now we have an activity-based overhead rate for purchasing, activity-based overhead rate for storing, for machining, and for supervision. We have the cost of each of those activities. Then we look at the products, the bench. How many activities did it consume in purchasing order? How many of the purchasing orders were related to the bench? How many purchasing orders were related to the coaster? And we assign the cost of purchasing based on the number of activities of purchasing that the bench consumed and the number of activities that the coaster consumed. For storing, we looked at square footage. Okay, how much square footage does the bench take? How much does the coaster take? 
the square footage times the activity rate per square foot uh, would be assigned to that. Machining, the number of hours. Employees, the number of employees. So you see, you get the picture, <laughs> the picture. That's what we're trying to do. That's what activity-based costing is. A little more complex, but it's not really once you get thinking along those lines. Here again is an expanded one, overhead costs. And we're looking at um, breaking that overhead cost into the costs related to ordering and receiving materials. And the cost of setting up machines, cost of purchasing, cost of assembly, inspecting, painting, supervisory. So we break the million dirhams into these seven categories. And then we look at the number of purchase orders we think we're going to do in a year. And we come up with an activity-based rate for purchasing. Then we come up with an activity-based rate for machine setups. We come up with uh, machine hour, activity-based rate per machine hour, activity-based rate per number of parts in assembly, activity-based rate per number of tests, and so on. Now, we then assign it to the products, and quite often a company now manufactures many more types of products, not just a coaster and a bench. Have, there's a lot of Manufacturing today is called flexible manufacturing. That means they'll produce one product in the morning, turn the machines over with the same machines, do a second pro product, turn it over, do a third product, and so on. Flexible manufacturing. So how do we, we can trace the direct material and direct labor to each one of those jobs, but how do we assign the overhead? We assign the overhead by keeping track of the number of activities that were performed in producing each job. Keep in mind, each job in job costing takes a different amount of material, labor, and, of course, overhead, because it's going to be taking more activities. It will be consuming more of these activities, and therefore, there's a greater or a closer match to the consumption of the overhead and the different products by using activity instead of just allocating like we did before. Now, there's still allocation here because... I'm estimating this and I'm estimating that. It's not allocation, but it's estimation. It's it's not quite exact, but it's a lot closer than it would be with job costing. Now, a couple of true or false things. A traditional costing system allocates overhead by means of a multiple overhead rates. Everybody? Can I yes. ask a question before we do the exercise? False. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to understand the difference between the activity-based costing and the traditional-based uh, costing. Now, is the difference only on how we allocate the overhead cost? Wait, 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 well, yeah, yeah, in a way, yeah. Uh, in, in a very traditional costing, we took one overhead pool, the whole amount of overhead, and one allocation base. And yeah. ABC, if you want to use that same language, we have seven overhead pools and seven allocation bases. Instead of direct labor, direct power, it's going to be the number of purchase orders. It's going to be activities. Whereas in job costing, it was the only activity was either direct, direct labor or machining costs and you only choose one you only did one in in traditional cost you had one pool and you chose whether to allocate that pool based on machine hours to your product and you would if it was a capital intensive kind of industry or whether you would prefer to use direct labor or direct cost now you'd use direct labor if the labor was all the same in the production of the job costs you would use direct labor costs if part of the process was uh, straight labor and the other part of the process involved engineers, you know what I mean? So yeah. you would use costs. That way you got a good relationship. But now with the complexity in the manufacturing system, there is no longer any relationship to the overhead and the direct labor. Because now 
If I looked at the cost of producing my desk, for example, in the old days, it was 40 material, 40 labor, and 20 overhead. But today, they would cut this with a laser, and they would glue it and press it and stuff like that. And if you looked at the total cost, it would be 40 material, of course, but it would be 40 overhead and only 20 labor. So assigning 40% of the cost of a product using direct labor, if you're out 5%, you're out a lot. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so a new way of doing it had to come up with. And that new way now is say, hey, hey, let's not focus on just allocating based on direct labor hours or machine hours. Let's look and say the complexity here means that they are consuming many more types of activities here. Electricity activities, machine setup activities, utilities, supervisory. And let's now cost the activities and then look at how many activities are consumed by the product. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Yeah, it's clear. Thank you. Okay, so now the answer to the first one here, of course, is false. Everybody said that, right? ABC allocates overhead in two stage. Yeah, that's true. First to the pools, and then from the pools to the product using a cost driver. Direct material and direct labor are easier to trace than overhead. Of sure. course, that's the job sheet. A manufacturing process has become more automated. More companies have chose to allocate based on direct labor costs. La, 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 la. That's false. Activity. In activity-based cost, an activity and event transaction is what was incurred in producing the product. Yes. All right, the four steps. Identify and classify the activities. That's what I said, take the million. Now the million, of course, is overhead costs, supervisor, and break it, not in, it's in one pool now. Break it into pools where the cost is similar. Okay, utility costs. So under utility, or uh, let's uh, capacity costs. Under capacity costs, we might have rent. We might have insurance, because that's part of capacity. Security, that's part of capacity. That might all be in one pool. You might have another pool, which is utility costs. Okay, they're overhead costs. They go up the more machine hours we have. But we say, okay, of the million, how much is related to that? Of the million, how much is related to the technical guys going in and setting up the machines for a new product line? That's called machine setup. How much of that cost in our total overhead? We break that into a pool. Supervision costs, we break that. So we identify within that overhead pool a number of different activities, and we sort of classify those activities, and we cost... Uh, class, we define those pools and we cost those pools. How much is the salary of the guys who change over the machine? How much, how long does it take them to do that? And so on and so on and so on. Okay, so now I've got all the costs in that pool. Then I look at what the driver is. Well, if it's number of machine hours, more machine hours, okay. How many machine hours do I think I'm gonna use in the year? If it's purchase orders, how many purchase orders do I think? I get a something. The driver has a, a very close correlation to the activity. That is, the more use of the driver, the more the cost of the activity. The driver is that thing that drives the cost. Purchase orders now are driving the cost because every time we initiate a purchase order, we have to run around the type up the order, get it sent off, and then we have to receive it in the store and things like that. Now, we have seven pools and we have seven drivers, and we come up with an activity-based overhead rate for each driver. So now we say this is the activity overhead rate per machine hour. This is the activity-based overhead rate for storage. This is the activity-based overhead rate for utilities, and so on. 
And then we assign the overhead to products based on how many activities were consumed by that product. All right, if there's 10 square feet, then we multiply that by the activity based overhead rate for square footage. If it was 50 purchasing orders for this product for the whole year, then we assign uh, 50 times the activity based overhead rate for purchasing to that product. So that's what it means. I assign overhead cost to products using the overhead rates determined in each cost pool. Now, it may seem a little complicated for you now, but you'll see that it's really quite straightforward. So let's go through an illustration. We're back to our bench and our coaster. And this will demonstrate for you the difference between traditional and ABC. All right, Atlas Company produces two products, a bench, an AB bench, and they sell a lot of them. In fact, they sell 25,000 usually a year. The coaster is a lower volume and they sell 5,000 units annually. Now each product requires one direct labor hour. So therefore, we estimate there's going to be 30,000 direct labor hours during the year, 25 and 5. All right. And the direct labor cost is $12. Now, the estimated annual overhead is 900,000. Direct material for the bench, 40, and for the coaster, 30. So using traditional costing, of course, I can trace the material cost to the bench and the coaster. Mafi muskila, that's easy. It's a direct cost. And the same with direct labor. It's one hour for the bench, so it's $12. One hour for the coaster is $12. But the predetermined overhead rate, keep in mind, my overhead was 900000 And I'm going to allocate it based on direct labor hours. And my direct labor hours were 30000 so for every hour worked on the bench, I'm going to allocate $30. Okay. 30 times one hour. So the bench gets one hour, so it gets 30. And the coaster one hour and gets that. So we say now that the bench costs me $82 and the coaster costs me 72 Now, this is very, very important, you see. Getting the exact cost of our product is so very important because the marketing people, this is just the product cost to produce. We still have the period cost, the selling, the administration, the uh, delivery cost, and the, and the quality follow-up, and all of those costs have to be covered in our sale, selling price, plus give us a profit. So as you take in marketing, there may be a 100% markup. Let's say there's a 100% markup. So the selling price for the bench now would be 164. Does everybody see that? 82 times 2, 100% markup. I'm going to mark it up exactly what it costs me. 82, and I'm going to mark it up 82. So my selling price is 164 for the bench. For the coaster, my selling price is 144. So keep those two figures in mind. And that's traditional costing. All right. We move now to activity-based costing. And the first step is to take a look at that overhead cost and break it into pools. Now we're keeping this rather simple. <clears throat> we only have three pools, setting up machines, machining and inspecting. So we break the 900 into 300 for setting up machines, 500 for machining and 100 for inspecting. Okay, are we clear to that? Straightforward. Now, this is estimated overhead at the beginning of the year. Now, we also estimate <coughs> the number of cost drivers. So, first of all, you have to identify the cost drivers. And for setting up the machine, we identify the number of setups. The more setups, the more costs. 
for machining costs, which is a, probably utilities and depreciation and uh, you know electricity and stuff like that, machine hours. The more the, the machines are running, the more the machining costs. So it's machine hours. And inspecting the number of inspections. So we look at that and we say, okay, the production guy, how many times do you think we're going to be doing a machine setup? over the course of the year. And they say 1,500 setups. Okay, production guy, how many machine hours do you think we're gonna to produce to do those 30,000? Remember, we're still 25,000. What was a bench and 5,000 coasters? To do those, how many machine hours? 50,000. Okay. Mr. Quality Man, how many inspections do you think you're going to be doing? Oh, 2,000 inspections. Okay. So you see, we have the estimated cost back here at the beginning of the year, and the estimated use of the cost driver per activity, 1,500. So we come up with the overhead, the activity-based overhead rate. We take the estimated overhead for that pool, divided by the number of cost drivers in that pool. So going back to the pool, setting up machines, we said the total cost in overhead would be 300,000. And we expect to do this 1,500 times during the year. So every time we do it, that activity is costing us 200 per setup. Machining, we expect 50,000 machines. So every hour those machines are running, we're gonna charge $10 to cover the depreciation on the machine and probably the, um, the uh, electricity to drive it and the grease and oil to look after it and stuff like that. For inspection, they say, okay, if you're gonna produce this many, we, we actually inspect the coaster more closely than we do the other, but we think there would be about 2000 inspections for these products, we're gonna look at it. So therefore, every time we do an inspection, we're gonna charge $50 to the product that they're inspecting. All right, now we assign the overhead cost. So we take the 1500 setups and we ask the production guy, how many you think would be for the bench? 500, how many for the coaster? 1000, okay. Uh, production guy, how many machine hours? 30 on the bench, which is surprising. Coaster I thought would take more. Uh, inspections, 500. Coaster is a little more complex, so there's more inspections. Now, I simply apply the rate by the activity. So, for the bench, and this is for the whole year, I'm doing the cost. I take the number of times we're going to set up the machines for the bench times the activity based overhead rate, and I say 100,000 is to the bench based on setups. I look at the number of machines, 30,000 times that. So 300,000 of that 900,000 is related to the machining costs of the bench. And 25,000 is related to inspecting. So I get 425,000. Keep in mind the total overhead was 900. Now 425 is related to the bench. And we produce 25,000 benches. So our unit cost is $17, not 30. Remember in the traditional costing system, we said the overhead cost was 30 for the bench. But with activities, it's now determined to be closer to 17. All right, let's look at the coaster. We go through the same thing with the coaster. We come up with 475 and we do 5,000 and look at the unit cost of the coaster. We said it was 30 before, now it's 95 because it's a smaller amount produced, it's more complex. So recall under traditional cost accounting, we allocated it based on direct labor hours and the one hour. So each bench was charged $30. Each coaster was charged 30. 
But my goodness, we've been overpricing the bench. Keep in mind, we were selling the bench for double 82, which is 164, because we thought it was 30 to produce it. It overhead was 30. No, the overhead is 17. And we've been sacrificing profitability by underpricing the coaster. The coaster costs us a lot more to produce. And here's the difference. So under traditional, I said it would cost 82. It actually costs 69. So if my marketing people mark it up 100%, this would be 138, not 164. So you see, we overpriced the bench. Okay. And we severely underpriced the coaster. My goodness. If marketing under traditional costing marked it up 100%, they were selling it for 144. But it was costing us 137 to manufacture it. So that is a rather extreme, but it's a it's an example that has been proven in the accounting literature over and over and over again. That activity-based costing is giving us a truer picture of the cost to produce a product by assigning the overhead costs to activities and then looking at the activities consumed by the different products. That's the example. Again, another example. This company, Casey Company, Again, we're only going to use five. This time, we're going to use five activity gospel and only two products. It expects to do, produce 200,000 units of automobile scissor jack and 80,000 of truck hydraulic jack. Well, anybody who knows this stuff knows that truck hydraulic jack uh, would consume a lot more material labor and therefore should consume much more overhead. Haven't identified the activity cost pools and cost drivers. Here we go. Okay, the total overhead for this company was 5,300,000, they estimated. They broke that into five pools, ordering and receiving, machining, setup, machining, assembly, and inspection. They said, okay, what drives the cost in ordering and receiving? The purchase order. What drives it in machine setup? Setups. What drives it? Machine hours, so on. And they broke it out. They broke the 5-3 into these cost pools. Then they estimated the number of times the activity would be performed in the year. This is estimated at the beginning of the year. 2,500 times because it's going to be 1,000 for the scissors jack and 1,500 for the hydraulic. Machine setup, 500 and 700. So you can see that the hydraulic is consuming more activities, more orders, more setups, uh, more machine hours, less parts, but and less inspection for some reason. Uh, scissors Jack is consuming more of the parts cost and more of the inspection, 20 versus 15. Nevertheless, these products are not consuming overhead in an equal fashion. That's the point I'm trying to make. So let's go through the problem. Well, the first step is take the estimated overhead, take the expected use of the cost driver, and come up with an overhead rate, 80. Then you do that for machine setup, for all of them. You come up with an activity-based overhead rate. So it's 80 per order, 500 per setup, 200 per test, and so on. Then you assign it back to the scissors and then the jack. Now the scissors was taking 1,000 ordering purchase orders. Each purchase order was $80. So 80,000 of the 200,000 is going to be for the scissors jack. 250 of the 600,000 is machine setup. 750 of the 2 million up above is going to be for the jack and so on. So now, 
Of the total overhead, 5,300, 2,500 is related to the scissors. How much related to the jack? 2,700. All right, but I produce less jacks than I do, uh, less hydraulic than I do scissors jack. So the total cost is sign. I produce 200,000 units of scissors jack. Therefore, the overhead per unit for scissors jack is 1280. Um, over here, the total overhead is that. So the overhead for hydraulic jack is 3425. Based on the activities that the hydraulic jack is consuming related to the scissors jack. The status shows that the total overhead assigned 80,000 hydraulic exceeds the overhead assigned to the scissors jack. The overhead cost per jack is 34. It's only 1280 for the scissors. All right. So again, the closer match when we set up the, we look at the overhead costs as a series of activities. We consume, we cost the activity, we're not costing the job, we cost the activity, and then we assign the activity by the consumption of that, of the activity by each product. So it's been proven, as I said in the literature, time and time again, that it's a more accurate product costing system. We are using more cost pools to assign overhead costs. We also have a way in which we can control the overhead costs. You see, before we had one pool, a million, and we said direct labor hours, 200,000. Well, there's no way we can control that pool. That was it. But when we break that million into activities and we start thinking that, look, the activities are consuming resources, i.e. flus. So if I reduce the amount of activities, I should be reducing the flus. Capiche? All right. And therefore, I have in a way a better way to control costs. Not only that, it makes better management decisions. Pricing, for example. But now we focus our attention on activities. However, I was involved, I think I told you, at the Emirates State Factory. We never really did get the activity-based costing system up and running. It was very complicated for many of the employees involved. So and it's expensive to set up. And still, like I said, there's some arbitrary allocations in a sense, because I'm estimating the overhead pools, I'm estimating the use of the driver and so on. When should we use ABC? Well, if we are in a company or we're providing services and we have a number of different services that we're providing, like in a hospital, okay? We can cost the activities to provide each one of those services and then look how much does the operation of this person take in terms of activities and we can come that way. In production, of course, many different types of product lines, different volumes of products. If I have a lot of volume of this product, small volume of that product, well doing it by direct labor allocation is not very smart. You should be doing it by activities. So the product lines are numerous and diverse. Overhead is a large part of the total cost. I said before that now overhead is getting close to 40% the total cost to produce a product. All right. The manufacturing process or a number of products has changed significantly. Um, and of course, it makes managers think in terms of activities. Now there's where we go. This has led to our lecture on Tuesday. It's going to be not a very long lecture. Because what I want you to be familiar with now is a new way of managing, and that's called activity-based management. Now, I'm talking about activity-based management here 
in terms of the product costs. That is the overhead cost to produce my product or service. When I talk about activity based on Tuesday, I'm going to talk about how we can cost the period costs. We never were able to do that before. Aha, we can cost the activities in HR. We can cost activities in the purchasing department and so on. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about activity based costing and management now looking at activities and realizing activities consume money. If I can reduce the number of times this activity is per performed, I can reduce the amount of money we spend on that activity. It makes absolute sense. But now I just can't go full throttle at attacking activities. There are some value added activities and there are non value added activities. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, to put it simply, you ask yourself if I reduce the number of times I perform this activity, would the customer perceive a difference in the quality of the product? And if the answer is yes, then that activity is a value added activity. And you'd be, be very careful in managing that. You don't want to reduce that because a reduction in value added activities leads to the perception by the customer that the product or service is not uh, the same quality as it was before. If the answer is no, for example, storage costs. If I reduce storage costs, does the customer perceive a difference? No. Well, that is a non-value added activity. And therefore, as a manager, I can focus on that activity and begin to control the costs of that activity. Reduce the number of times I handle a product. Reduce the need to store that much that for that time. Okay, so we look at all the activities in the overhead product costs. That is the machining setup and inspection and like we just did in the examples. And we look and we say, OK, machining, yeah, if we reduce that, that's value added. But there's storage in there. There was inspection and testing. Well, I can reduce the number of times that has taken place and therefore reduce the total cost. So now as a manager, you manage activities. Of course, people are performing the activities, so enhance your you're managing that. There's direct material to each activity, direct labor and overhead. In a manufacturing company, value added activities would be engineering design. If I cut back on that design, customer would perceive that. Machining services, assembly, painting. If I try to reduce the number of times those activities were performed, there could very well be a reduction in the quality of my product and therefore that activity is value added. And you'd be very careful in managing that. In a service company, if it's a hospital, performance surgery, if it's a law firm, research, if it's a delivery firm, delivery and packages, all of those are value added activities. Non-value, the repair of machines, storage of inventory, moving of inventory, number of times I move the inventory, it's costing me more money. And that's why you have in cellular manufacturing, if you ever come across cellular manufacturing, or lean manufacturing, anybody involved in that. Uh, or what, what do they call it? Six Sigma manufacturing, inventory control. If you're a service company, taking appointments, bookkeeping, ah, us accountants are non-value added activities. Traveling ordering, advertising. So I think you get the idea. We have moved from looking at costing a job, we're still costing a job, but we're looking at it a lot closer now. We can trace direct material as we always did, we can trace direct labor, but now 
we are almost tracing the overhead cost to the product in a very loose way, but still we know exactly how many times the activity is performed. That is sure, but the total amount of